Hi everyone! Today I'll tell you about the sinking of the Estonia ship, swallowed up by the cold and merciless Baltic Sea, whose icy and stormy waters in 1994 took the lives of hundreds of people in one of the worst shipwrecks in history. The Baltic Sea is an inland sea and is located in northeastern Europe, nestled between the Scandinavian peninsula and the coast of northern Europe. It is a shallow sea, its average depth is 55 meters, it's characterized by low salinity due to the low water exchange it has with the Atlantic Ocean and the water courses that flow into it. The water temperatures of the Baltic Sea can vary from minus 1 degree in January up to 20 degrees in August. Between September and October, the average temperature is around 10 degrees, and precisely in this period, the Estonia flag, the Ropax passenger ship MV Estonia, departed from the port of Tallinn, carrying 989 people on board for a scheduled voyage to Stockholm. At about 1.50 am on the 28th of September 1994, the ship sank rapidly and disappeared from the radar screens. The ship launched on April 26th in 1980 with the name of Viking Sully, over the years changed owner and name several times, becoming Celia Star then was a king, finally becoming Estonia in January 1993, taking the colors of the Eastline Company, owned half Estonian and half Swedish, serving to connect Tallinn with Stockholm and vice versa. She was 155.4 meters long and 24.2 meters wide, having a maximum capacity of 2,000 passengers and being able to carry 460 cars inside her garage, which was located on deck 2, with further platforms on deck 3, which had three loading entrances, two aft loading ramps and one bow loading ramp, enclosed by a hinged visor that opened upwards. In total, the ship consisted of 10 decks. Below the garage decks, there was an economy accommodation area on deck 1 and a large sauna and swimming pool area on deck 0. The main passenger accommodation areas were on decks 4, 5 and 6. Crew members generally occupied decks 7 and 8 and the navigation bridge was located on deck 9. The ship was equipped with water ballast and dealing tank system for a total of 1,212 cubic meters. In particular, I'd like to mention the two side healing tanks, with a capacity of 183 cubic meters each which served to regulate the lateral inclination of the ship in case of necessity. The inclination that could be compensated for was about 8 degrees with one tank full and the other empty. During her operational career, maintenance, repairs and inspections were carried out according to the standards of the relevant maritime bodies. In addition to this routine maintenance, Focusing on the bow ramp, a couple of times minor repairs were reported to cracks in the ramp locking devices and damages to a visor inch spin repaired at the Finbody shipyard in Stockholm. On the 27th of September 1994, at the port of Tallinn, the loading of Estonia began at 4.20 pm through the front ramp. Inside the garage there were cars, but mainly heavy vehicles. Due to an alleged bad cargo stowing plan, the MV Estonia departs having an offset in transfer center of gravity resulting in one 2 degrees starboard least, 
with the result that the shift departed with the port healing tank nearly full and the starboard tank empty. The chief officer in charge of the garage had given instructions to secure the heavy load carefully, due to the rough weather forecast. Actually, the weather forecast for the night was certainly not good. According to the weather reports, there were a severe depression overlooking the Baltic Sea, with strong wind gusts from the southwest. At approximately 11 pm on the 27th of September at the Boxer Lighthouse, a wind speed of 24.6 meters per second was measured, equal to 88.5 km per hour, and waves were up to 5 meters high. Estonia departed from Tallinn at 7.15 pm, 15 minutes after the scheduled departure time, carrying 803 passengers and 186 crew. Full service speed, I mean around 19 knots, was assumed to have been maintained from the Tallinn breakwater to the Osmusar lighthouse, which was passed around 10 pm, making up for the time lost at the departure. After passing the Osmusar lighthouse, Estonia lost the shelter offered by the coast, running into worse weather conditions which gradually caused her to lose speed. Due to a bad cargo and full wind force on the port side, once in the open sea, Estonia continued her voyage at a starboard list of about 24 degrees, therefore greater than at her departure. At about 0 and 30, Estonia reaches the waypoint. After changing course, her bow direction was changed from 262 degrees to 287 degrees in a northwesterly direction. By varying the course angle, Estonia suffered the impact of the waves at an angle of 30 degrees to port, thus increasing the roll and the load of forces that the bow had to withstand. To decrease roll following the passing of the waypoint, Engagement of the fin stabilizer had been ordered, and speed had dropped to about 14 knots. At about 0 and 45 am, on his round, a seaman was standing just in the vicinity of the bow ramp, when Estonia suffered a severe wave impact that almost made him fall backwards. He reported hearing a strong metallic bang coming from the bow area as if a piece of metal was hitting another block of metal. Alerted by this unusual bang, he called the bridge and reported the event. The first official asked him to survey the area and identify the source of the anomaly, but nothing was found to be reported. It was at this moment that the tragedy began. The loud bang the seaman heard was most likely the partial failure of the locking devices of the bow cover. According to official reports, the greatest damage is believed to have occurred in a subsequent impact with a wave, shortly after the first metallic bang heard by the seaman. A few minutes later, the third engineer, who was in the engine control room, heard the banging and looked into the bow ram surveillance camera monitor and saw that a significant amount of water was forcing its way around the sides of the ramp, even if it seemed to be closed for the moment. The unfortunate constructive peculiarity of the ship consisted in the fact that from the bridge the bow was not visible due to the very advanced deck superstructure so it was not possible to know what was happening. Shortly thereafter, the seamen on duty, still hanging around the garages, alerted the bridge that water was entering through the bow ramp. At around 1, 1.02 am, the ship listed suddenly to starboard. Bottles and glasses began to fall from the shelves of the bars, the furniture that was not fixed to the floor slid straight, crashing against the walls, as did everything that was not anchored. 
One survivor's alarm clock fell off the cabin table, lost its battery, and the clock stopped at 1.02 a.m. All the visor ramp locks broke as the bow impacted the subsequent waves, allowing the visor to partially open. Once the visor had lifted off its locating horns, the rear wall made contact with the ramp, striking its top edge and thus breaking the locking blocks. The ramp fell forward, resting onto the visor structure. The left inch of the visor broke due to the overload generated by the high torsional moments. The starboard inch tore following the clockwise rotations of the visor. In a few minutes, the visor began to fall forward. The ramp then followed the visor in a forward twisting motion. The visor subsequently tilted over the bow, leaving the ramp fully open, thus allowing large amounts of water to enter the garage deck. The banks from the bow area ended with some strong metallic crashes, caused by the final separation of the visor and its collision with the bulb of the bow. The visor fell into the sea and sank at about 1.05 a.m. At this point, the water entering the garage, estimated equal to 20 tons per second, caused the ship to list to starboard at an angle of more than 20 degrees. On the navigation bridge, a port turn was initiated, and the engine control levers were pulled to idle, hoping that the wind and the swell taken from the opposite side would somehow help to straighten the ship, bringing the bow to leeward. The port turn revealed to be a mistake, because it increased the ship's seal angle even more, increasing the flow of the water into the garage. One of the survivors, who was in the open aft area on deck 6, testified that the ship listed rapidly and that it was impossible to walk without falling. Hanging to the rail, he dragged himself around the aft deck to the port side of the ship, there, he stuck his head out and looked ahead. The ship was now slowing and turning to port, and part of the fin stabilizer could be seen above the surface of the water. At this time, several decks downwards, a huge amount of water floated through the stairs in the center of the garage, down to the cabin areas on deck 1, which was located below the garage. There were 124 staterooms extending from amidships to the bow. A central corridor with six flights of stairs joined several cross corridors, which led to the cabins. Of the six existing staircases, three ended on deck four, and only one of these joined the central staircase, which led directly up to deck seven. The rest led to the garage. The passengers who were awake started running up the stairs under a shower of water. However, the strong inclination of the ship certainly didn't help the crossing of the corridors and stairs. Only 22 of the occupants of this deck survived. Three of them were engine control room Q, and 19 were passengers. On deck 4, there were two cabin areas, one forward and the other amidships. These two areas were separated by the atrium of the main stairs leading to deck 7, where the lifeboats were located. At the aft, there was the night clamp, still open at the time. Some people, alerted by the inclination of the ship, escaped and got to safety. A witness said he saw many people panicking, some of them were sitting tight in the corner, unable to do anything. Of Deck 4, only 32 people escaped death. On Deck 5, there was a bow cabin area, almost identical to that on Deck 4, with 102 cabins. The rest of the deck was dedicated to shopping and entertainment areas, together with an armchair lounge. On this deck, only 31 people got to safety, four of them being in their cabins, the others, however, 
being in the entertainment areas such as the Admiral Pub, the Neptunus Café, or in the common areas. On deck 6 there was a forward cabin area with 103 cabins. In the central part there were the Baltic Bar and the Seaside Restaurant, closed at that time. Along the aft direction there was the Poseidon Restaurant, closed as well. During the evening at the Baltic Bar, the band and dance troupe were due to perform until 2 a.m., but they ended their show early, around 0.30, due to EVCs. On deck 6, the survivors were 16. Deck 7 was dedicated to the crew, with a total of 79 cabins. In addition, the lifeboats and their winches were located on the outer deck on either side of the vessel. On this deck, 26 people were saved. Deck 8, in the forward part, gave accommodation to the captain, the chief engineer, the owner and the radio operator. At the aft, there were 18 cabins for officers and crew. Only 4 people were saved on this deck. At 1.07 am, Feire, Feire, which means alarm in Estonian, is announced from the information desk on deck 5. The list is now about 25-30 degrees. At 1.08 am, a first distress call is sent out and heard on VHF channel 16 by a seaman on board a vessel in the vicinity. The call comprised only three maydays, hence no identification of the ship in distress could be made. At 1.10 a.m., ship seal is now between 35 and 40 degrees. Due to this heavy list and the probable flooding of deck 1, the pair of port engines stalled. Shortly after, the starboard engines will also stop, causing the start of the emergency auxiliary engine, which will shut down, in turn, at 1.17 a.m. At 1.22 am, the first officially recorded May Day is transmitted by the third engineer, and it declares having a blackout. The closest ships which pick up the May Day are the Cilia Europa and the Mariella, which try in vain to get their position from Estonia. After a few minutes, Estonia manages to transmit her position to the two ships, which change course to reach the ship in distress. At 1.27 am, the last call for help is sent from the common bridge of Estonia, but the transmission stops, the emergency generator stops, leaving the ship in total darkness. By now, Estonia is at an angle of about 80-85 degrees. About 250 people managed to reach deck 7, put on life jackets and went outside. Most of them were without clothes, some of them only in their underwear, and others naked. As the vessel capsized and began to sink by the stern, many of them fell or plunged into the icy rough waters of the Baltic Sea. A total of 852 people were killed in the accident. During the rescue and in the following days, 92 people were found in the water and in the life rafts, dead from hypothermia or drowning. Two bodies were later found in the Gulf of Finland area, one offshore and the other off the coast of Estonia. Only 138 people will be rescued, one of whom will die later in hospital. When the ship assumed an angle between 140 and 150 degrees, it capsized completely, sinking on a muddy seabed about 80 meters deep, so trapping about 757 people inside. At 1.48 a.m. on September 28, in 1994, the motor vessel Estonia disappeared forever from the radar screen at Uto radar station. 
In the following hours, 34 people were rescued by the ferry Silla Europa, Mariella, Isabella, and by the patrol boat Tursas. The remaining survivors were rescued with a joint action of 26 helicopters from various nations. The searches and recovery of bodies and objects continued until October 2, and afterwards the searches took place with regular patrol flights by planes and helicopters. On September 30, 1994, the hydrographic survey vessel Sunta, using sonar and echo sounder, found the wreck on the seabed. The vessel was lying on a layer of soft clay, the bow at a depth of 85 meters, and the aft at 74 meters. Between the 2nd and the 10th of October, inspections were activated by an ROV, a remotely operated submarine, and on November the 18th, the bow visor was also recovered, which was located approximately one nautical mile from the wreck of the ship. In the aftermath of the disaster, many families requested the remains of their beloved ones be taken from the wreck to be returned to them. But the Swedish government refused to rescue the wreck and recover the bodies, citing moral reasons and potential trauma to the divers. The same government then suggested covering the wreck with a concrete screed, in order to be able to carry out a burial, which, however, will never be carried out. Shortly thereafter, Sweden, Estonia, Finland, Latvia, Poland, Denmark, Russia and the United Kingdom signed an international treaty, the 1995 Estonia Agreement, which prohibits any citizen of these countries from even approaching the ranch. Quickly, the attitude of the governments and the signing of the agreement raised doubts and questioned the official report, particularly among the families of the victims. The German journalist Jutta Rabe decided to conduct an investigation. In 2000, with the help of the American adventurer Greg Bemis, a dive on the wreck was organized under the helpless lies of the Swedish authorities who could not intervene, not being Germany and the United States signatories to the treaty. During this dive, a large gash in the hull was observed, just below the waterline. According to their analysis, this gash indicated that an explosion had occurred. Furthermore, most of the witnesses interviewed by Yutarabe stated that they heard, in addition to planning banks, several explosions before the ship began to list. Although some of the claims were consistent, the explosion theory was not fully substantiated and the thorough inspection of the hull was not permitted. Subsequently, other disturbing elements emerged, including claims by a former Swedish customs official that Estonia was transporting stolen Soviet war material westward. In fact, military equipment passed on board the ship several times, in particular on the day of the sinking, when two military tracks embarked. However, there is no official evidence that there was any smuggling going on. In July 2021, due to doubts about this first investigation, a new inquiry was opened into the possibility that the sinking was due to a hole in the hull. Studies and investigations are still ongoing.